Hey everybody, it's Vanessa, the Crafty Gemini. Welcome to episode 73 of Whip Wednesday. So we're going to assume that the technology is working for us because I can hear myself over there. So if you can see me and hear me, let me know in the chat box below just to make sure everything is working. Hi everybody, my chat pulled up just fine. I see a bunch of you are tuning in. Hi, Teresa from Tennessee. Margie from Wisconsin's in the house. Mary Grace from Colorado. Hey, Judy. Anne from Kentucky, and we got Rose tuning in from Highland Mills, New York. Awesome. Well, I'm coming to y'all from my home sewing studio here, a crafting studio, uh, in North Central Florida, just north of Gainesville, where it um, is finally starting to cool off again. We did have a freeze last month, right? It froze here for a bit and then back up higher temps, and today it's starting to drop a little bit more. So... Okay, great. Y'all can see me and hear me. Let's go ahead and get started. Today's episode, so Whip Wednesday, for those of you that may not know or if you're new and catching me live here, Whip is W-I-P and it stands for a work in progress. We are changing it up a little bit now that obviously we're on episode 73. I've done this a long time. Um, we are going to be, well, I'm going to be answering some of y'all's pre-submitted questions that have to do with the types of crafts that I work on. So mostly sewing and quilting. Right now we have recently, uh, or last week we opened up my new 10th edition Crafty Gemini bag club online. And it's a mini bag club part two. So we're tackling mini bag projects like uh, wallets and bags and drawstring pouches, little snap wallets and things like that. And so we went ahead and pulled some of the questions from the form that we send out in our email newsletter. You can probably find the form. I think it's in the description box of this video as well. And it's a Google form for you to submit any questions that you would like for me to consider on a future episode of Whip Wednesday. Okay. So for today, I pulled four questions and these have to do with mini bag projects and interfacings. I feel like it doesn't matter how many videos I do on interfacings, you could still talk about interfacings forever, right? So last week, I think it was last week, I posted a video on my YouTube channel talking about interfacings and bag interfacing. So let's go ahead and swap them to this over the shoulder camera so that I can show the little samples that I had here. Some of you maybe have watched that video, I'm not sure, but if you haven't and you want to get more information beyond today's episode, you can check it out on my YouTube channel. Um, it, it's kind of me sharing some tips with y'all on how to select uh, the right interfacing for the bag project that you're working on, okay? Thank you, Gloria. She says, remember to thumbs up, everybody. Yeah, if you're learning something from this video as I continue to demo and talk to you all about the stuff here, feel free to give it a thumbs up. You can also share it with your friends. If you're on Facebook, you can click the share button. That'll share it on your feed so your crafty friends can see it. Okay, so here I have obviously the same fabric, but it has been fused or sewn to different types of interfacing. So from the top, it doesn't really look like much, right? But if I pick them up and flip them over, the ones that are fused, we obviously see that there's something adhered to the back. And most of you that you know work with a lot of interfacings, you can probably, like I can, tell if I were to touch, if you were to touch these ones, you could tell which one was which. So I, just from touching them, can tell that this is the lightest one. So this chunk of fabric was fused to a 100% cotton woven fusible interfacing, which is probably the most commonly used interfacing, I would say, among quilters and bag makers. Okay, we use it a lot. Uh, I use the Bozal Fashion Fuse, and then um, the Pellon equivalent is Shape Flex. I always want to forget it. Pe uh, Pellon Shape Flex or SF101. So you probably have a bolt of it because you got it at Joann's with a coupon. Who knows? I know a lot of you out there like that, but that's the product that's been fused to the back of this, okay? So it just adds a little bit more hand to the cotton fabric, which I consider a medium weight woven fabric, quilting cotton, okay? Then next up would be this one, which if I showed them to you like this, you can probably see that on camera, that this one is a little bit chunkier, like loftier than the thinner one, okay? Because this is has been fused to a light fusible batting, and we all know batting, whether it's fusible or not, it has that fluff, right? The puffiness that we love to feel on the inside, that middle layer of our quilt sandwiches when we make quilts. When you make bags, it's really good to feel kind of, you know, that little fluffiness, the thickness. It also adds shape and body to the finished project that you're making. So this was light fusible batting. And it's important to note that it is light fusible batting because not all fusible batting is created equally and it's not the same as fusible fleece. Okay, Man different manufacturers will create different lofts, different amounts. Sometimes on the packaging, you'll see where it says 4.6 ounce, 6 ounce, whatever. 
Obviously, the more ounce measurement you see there, the thicker it's going to be, meaning the heavier that product is, okay? Uh, Zena is asking, is the fusible interfacing single or double-sided? So that's a great question, but it's going to depend on what product you're talking about. None of the ones that I have here are double-sided. If you do have a double-sided uh, interfacing, you have to think that it's not just going to add the thickness of whatever that interfacing is, but also you're ha adding two layers of adhesive. So when that glue gets heated and fused, it melts, right? So it's more pliable. So you may be thinking that the fabric is not going to be that stiff, but after you fuse, say, fabric to both sides and it cools, that glue and the adhesive is going to tighten back up, and that's why it's holding the fabric layers to it. It gets stiffer, okay, when it gets cool. So you got to account for the two layers of adhesive plus whatever the weight of the actual interfacing is so that you can try and gauge what the finished hand of the fabric is going to be, okay? All right, uh, let's see. Oh, Mary Grace says, yep, she's one of those. She buys her interfacing by the bolt, <laughs> the SF-101. All right, the next one I have here, so we had cotton woven fusible interfacing, then we had light fusible batting, then we have here, it's a crisper one. You see how that kind of looks like a, almost like a postcard or a cardstock? This has been fused to Bozal DuraFuse. Um, some of y'all in my Facebook group said what the Pelon equivalent was. I don't know what it is. But there is, oh, yeah, no, I said it. Wait, this is DuraFuse. So the Pellon equivalent is Craft Fuse. That's Pellon 808. That's what the Pellon equivalent is of this. I'm thinking of the, the gridded interface, and that's a different one. Okay, so this one has a crisp hand. This is non woven, meaning it's a synthetic one. It's crisper. It feels more papery, okay? But it's a fusible. And again, all these are one sided fusible. So this side, it doesn't matter what I, what I iron on or anything. There's no adhesive, in other words, on this back side. All right. The last one that I have here is foam interfacing. And if y'all make bags, you've probably used this before. So this one is Bozal Interform, it, which is the sew-in version. This is what I tend to use these days. But it also comes in one-sided fusible and in two-sided fusible. So if you need to fuse something to both sides, you can get it in that. There's also Biani Soft and Stable. And then Pellon also has a foam equivalent. Okay, so all those. Now, these, these different interfacings, when they're fused to the same fabric, they act, I mean, I would say totally differently. So you have to be really mindful of like, if you're not following pattern instructions where a designer has picked out the specific interfacing they want you to use for a reason, then you need to have hopefully built up enough experience with different products and say, quilting cotton across the board so that you can say, okay, I think this might be a little too thick for this, or this might work for this pocket. If you're designing your own projects and if you're hacking other people's patterns, because you can't just say, well, I don't want it to be this floppy. And I'll give you an example here. This is the origami patchwork pouch that we have, that we've already um, uploaded the videos for, for my mini bag club two that's open now. This project went up yesterday, the step-by-step -step video lessons on how to make it in two sizes, of course, these are the ones that I made um, when I filmed the course, so they're just made out of scrap fabrics, but you can see that I use directional prints, and I do that on purpose so that when I'm teaching y'all in the video lessons, for those of you that are enrolled in the club already, I show you, hey, if you're using a directional print, it, at this step, make sure that that directional print is reading top to bottom. When you do this and that, make sure that, again, you're marking which way the fabric is up and all that. So I share tips with you on how to work with directional prints. So if you're one of those that has gorgeous directional prints in your stash, but you never want to cut them because you're afraid you're going to mess them up, in my classes, I tell you how to align things. I share tips and tricks so that you can minimize your chance of wrecking that fabric or ending up with, instead of upright unicorns like this, having them be sideways or worse, upside down, right? We hate when that happens in our projects. The projects are still usable, but sometimes, you know, it's, it's not as pretty to look at, especially if you wanted it to look like this, okay? So in this project, what I was going to say is that, say you saw this pouch and you thought, oh, I have a ton of batting, or I have a lot of fusible fleece. I'm going to use fusible fleece to make this pouch. You have to, one, consider what type of interfacing, how thick it is, whether it's fusible or not fusible, and where in the project you're going to use it. So it's super important. If, and I can tell you flat out right now, if you are trying to substitute interfacing in a project that features a drawstring closure of any kind, 
Think twice about changing it to a fluffier or thicker interfacing from whatever the designer has listed on the pattern, okay? Because this part at the top that needs to be scrunched up is not going to work with foam interfacing, okay? It, it's just too thick. It's lightweight, but when you go to cinch it up, you might pull, 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 and it might close that much. Because between the layers of the fabric that are here, you have exterior, you have lining fabric, then you have the thickness of the interfacing in there. You're not going to be happy with the results if you go way too thick or fluffy on something that has a drawstring closure. Okay? The same thing applies to like cork fabric, a really stiff vinyl, a cotton canvas, something like that that's stiffer. You're going to want to test it out first before you start cutting into it and making your project. Okay? Uh, let's see. I'm going to pop in real quick in the chat and see what kind of questions I'm getting real quick because I still want to get to um, to showing you something about this one in a second. All right. Let's see. Yeah, uh, Maureen is saying that we're out of the light fusible batting. We have an order that's on the way. As soon as we get it back in, we will restock it. And that goes for any products that y'all want to buy off our website, which is craftygemini.com. Uh, you can click the shop link there and anything that's sold out, you'll see at the bottom there, a uh, waitlist button. It says join waitlist. So if you add or you click that button and add your email address, as soon as we restock it and it's back in inventory, you'll get an automatic email notification from our system telling you, hey, that product that you were on the waitlist for has now been added. So yeah, Maureen, we're out of that right now. A lot of you that have signed up for the mini bag club too have bought us out of the fashion fuse, which is the, the Bozal cotton woven fusible interface. I think we're really low on the Durafuse, but we're waiting on another order to come in. So as soon as that's in, we will uh, restock and let y'all know. Okay. Hi, Tracy. She says, is it too late to join the mini bag club? It is not. The link is in the chat. We'll put it for you. It's also in the video description. Uh, it's in the, the post. If you're on Facebook, you are on Facebook. So uh, it's in the caption there. And on any of the posts that I've done recently since last week on my page, you'll see the link. So no, the, the last day to sign up and save for the mini bag club number two, y'all is on Friday, this Friday, November 18th at midnight Eastern time is when we close the registration. We will reopen the club in the new year, but you won't have the live, the live elements to it where we do live question and answer sessions. And I do, um, a live zoom social hours. You won't get any of those because they'll have passed by then. Right? So if you join now, you can still participate in the whole thing because, uh, we've only posted one of the projects. The three bonus projects courses are there, but of the main five, this one is already there. It's, it was posted on Monday, and then on Friday, we're moving on to the second bag. Okay, so those videos will be posted there. Okay. Oh, thank you, Carla. She says, I'm always successful with all your classes. I love, love, love to hear it. All right. Um, okay. So let me go back to this because I think also sometimes when I say this, like don't add a puffier batting or anything to something with a drawstring, people need to like see it to get it before they waste their fabric and their time. So I'm going to show you here. I have this fabric and I started to fuse it already because of course this was in my bin here of random scraps of interfacing and I didn't have the name, so I didn't know what it was, but it is a double sided, um, a double sided fusible fleece. It's called a uh, Bozal Duet Fuse 2, meaning it's it's fusible on both sides. So this is significantly thicker than that light fusible batting that I talked to y'all about. So another thing to consider, like when we talk about it's puffier, it's loftier, it's thicker, look how sheer this one is in compared to this one. You can barely see anything of my hand through the one on my right side, on my right hand, and the light fusible batting you can see on my fingers. So this is going to affect definitely the hand of your project in the fabric, right? If you want something a little bit lighter, this is going to be your go-to, something like this. So if you're at a fabric store, pull a little bit off the bolt and go like that, put it up to the light, put your hand behind it. Can you see your hand or not? Then you can get a good idea of like, whoa, this is kind of thick. Look how thick this is. It's thick. I mean, it's almost a quarter of an inch thick, huge difference. Okay. So you got to be really careful. I mean, and this stuff is great. If I, what have I used it for? Um, to put behind, say, a big patchwork block and turn it into a throw pillow. I fuse the fabric to this. I'll fuse some lining fabric to the back. And that patchwork block, with no matter how many seam intersections, is going to stay perfectly crispy as a front of a pillow cover, okay? I do this also. I've used the Duet Fuse 2 for table runners. Quilted projects that you want to lie completely flat and stiff, things that you don't want to be super drapey. So wall hangings, things that you want to hang that are just like 
boom, you know, it stays its shape. This is a good one. I'm going to pull out my ironing board here because I'm going to fuse this fabric to it. And let me grab my, oh, here's the iron. Make sure it's heated up. Oh, yes, yeah, somebody, I see somebody was asking if we're going to be offering these mini bag projects uh, individually in the new year. We are, we, we are also in the process of listing the ones from the first mini bag club project that we did earlier this summer. Um, those projects will be individually listed for sale like all the other 90 plus digital courses that I sell on the site. Uh, obviously, they're going to be more expensive if, you know, as individually like a la carte like that. But yes, if you only like one project or two, they'll be available in the new year for you to uh, purchase and sign up for them like that separate. Okay. So here's the fabric. We said it was two-sided fusible. So I'm going to try not to hold it too long because I do not want this to fuse on here. And that's a tip. If you're working with a double-sided fusible product, you can put a Teflon sheet underneath. If you're fusing two fabrics, go ahead and just put the fabric that you need to fuse on the other side right under there. What you don't want to do is be blasting steam, steam, steam while you're pressing down super hard on this because that will activate the adhesive here and you'll stick it to your ironing board. Okay, so be careful with that. This one, I don't even need steam. This iron gets super hot. All right. So Maureen is asking, I have fashion fuse. Can I use it in place of the light fusible uh, batting for the sandy foam pouch? You can. That's one project where you absolutely can. And, and actually, one of the other questions I have uh, to answer here today, I'm going to show you a visual that will help you with that. Okay. I don't want to burn myself, so hold on. Let me scoot this out. Okay, so I have this chunk of fabric that I just fused only to one side of the Bozal Duet Fuse too. okay? It is double-sided fusible, so you could fuse fabric to the other side. Now, another thing is, if you have a product that's two-sided, like double-sided fusible, you don't have to fuse fabric to the inside here. If you're using, uh, maybe you're making a tote bag with a drop-in lining or something, you just ignore the adhesive on here. You'll be fine, too. You know, you can still use it. It's just obviously the ones that have more adhesive sides tend to be more expensive, okay? Okay. So, this is here. I'm going to go like this and fold it in half. And I'm going to stitch a channel right here to simulate a casing of a drawstring. Because I want y'all to see... I mean, and you can even see it right here. So these are like little experiments that we do as designers. It's like, hmm, is that going to work? You run up a quick little prototype, use the interfacing that you're thinking, do a step of it just to see if that's going to work. And I could tell right now, if I was auditioning one of these bags to instead of using, well, I'll use this one for the example because in the big one here, we use interfacing. On the little guy of the origami patchwork, we don't even use interfacing. It's little, and look, it stands up by itself even without any interfacing, okay? So I talk all about that in the video courses for that in the bag club. But if I wanted to say, okay, I want this pouch to be a little bit puffier, I'm thinking I'll use Duet Fuse 2, a thicker fusible fleece type product, okay? If I fold this in half and say this is the top where this seam is, this is simulating an exterior, the fusible fleece, the other side exterior, fusible fleece, and this is without even including the lining fabrics and any interfacings that may go in there, depending on the project, right? So let's get the sewing machine. I'm going to stitch a, a, a little casing in there, and you're going to see that just off of that, you're going to be like, there's no way that that could be a drawstring because it's too bulky to try and cinch it up with a ribbon or cording or whatever you feel like doing, okay? Ooh, I'm checking. Let me make sure I'm plugged up here. Okay. So. Doo -doo -doo. Is it beeping or something? No. This should be down. All right. So I'm going to lengthen my stitch length a little bit because we're going through bulk. And y'all know I always recommend that. So let's say 
2.8. Here's this. Say we're making a one inch casing, okay? Let me see. One inch is here. So I'm going to start. I'm following whatever my seam guide is. Back stitch. Make sure nothing gets hung up. Now on this machine, I'm just going to say it because I don't have to really use a walking foot on this machine unless I'm sewing super duper bulky stuff. So what you're seeing me do here, you may not be able to do on your machine with this bulk. So just keep that in mind. You know, if you've tried some projects and you know that your machine cannot handle that bulk, then you may want to, for something like this, even if you're experimenting, consider uh, putting on the walking foot. Okay, so that's quite bulky. And remember, this is simulating. This is a prototype without any lining. So you already know, if it's looking thick like this, it's going to be even thicker once you account for the lining. Now, even if I go like this without having a proper drawstring in there, and I try to scrunch this up, it wants to bounce back on me and fight away from my hands because it is so puffy. There's so much going on there. It's not going to stay. Like, you'll be able to cinch it up as tight as you can. It's still going to be loose, like the opening part. And you won't be able to just easily pull like this and have it cinch up completely closed to where nothing can fall out, okay? So think about those things when you're selecting these puffier interfacings because you're thinking, hey, I just want to have a little bit more loft to the outside of the bag. It may not work if the bag has something like this, okay, where it has a drawstring closure. You need to have fabric and interfacing, if, if any interfacing involved, to be light enough to be able to gather because that's the whole closure of the project, okay? So that's what I wanted to show y'all, just so you can see how thick, I mean, it's plush. That's going to be a nightmare to try and cinch up with a drawstring, okay? Especially if it's in a real project and we have lining involved there as well. Okay, so that... Um, is what I wanted to explain to y'all from the question that was, if I want to fluff your pouch, can I use batting instead of the fashion fuse? In the origami, that was a question specifically for this one that I got from one of the bag club members this week for the origami Patrick pouch. So again, if it has a drawstring closure, try to go more for something light so that it can gather, okay? The next question was, can we, uh, can we use heavy starch in place of a fashion fuse or a cotton wo uh, woven fusible interfacing? And so the answer to that, at least, as far as I'm concerned, is yes and no, okay? You can use starch in place of a fashion fuse because the starch is going to stabilize your fabric. Where are my other two scraps that I cut out? These ones. So the starch is going to stiffen the fabric, right? Especially if you do multiple passes. If you spray starch with the, you know, press it with the iron. If you add more starch and you press again and add more starch, you can do three, four, five layers, however crispy you want that fabric to be. However, it's not going to stay there, right? Because if it is a project that is going to be washed, as soon as you wash it, the fabric is going to collapse back down to whatever its original state was because the starch will no longer be there. Whereas if you use the cotton woven fusible interfacing, this stuff that we've been talking about, it stays there because it's fused and it becomes a permanent addition to the fabric. So the answer is yes and no because it's going to depend on how you're going to use the project. What type of bag is it? Is it going to be a tote that gets washed often? Is it a, you know, a wallet that you're going to be handling all over the place or whatever? So uh, let's go ahead and starch this one just because I want to show you the difference between heavy starching a couple of passes on your fabric and the fabric itself just as it came off the bolt. Now a quick pressing tip. Don't ever hit your iron where you see the starch pooled like this because it's immediately going to turn into flakes and just start flaking all over your iron and the fabric. So don't do what I did and spray it too long in one corner. But once the fabric has absorbed the starch, I'm just going to dry it. So I don't have any, st or any water in my iron. I use the moisture of the starch and the heat of the dry iron to create the steam that then helps me kind of pre-shrink the fabric. So a lot of times I get asked, do you wash your fabrics before you start? If it's a high quality quilting cotton, I'm not pre-washing anything unless it's like a really dark red or a navy batik or something like that. They don't really bleed like that, at least in my experience. I don't really work with super, like with colors and stuff that would bleed. You can always test them a little bit. Um, 
but because adding any type of moisture and heat is going to shrink the fabric when it adds the heat and the moisture, I just go ahead and do it because I'm starching my fabrics anyways. I am a big uh, starcher when it comes to prepping my fabrics, whether I'm working on mini bag projects, bigger size bags, or quilts, okay? Mary's asking, uh, which starch do I use? This is just, whoop, almost dropped it. This is just what I have on hand. This is the Niagara Heavy Finish. I, whatever heavy starch I can get my hands on, I get it. I'm never going to go for one that says it's lightweight or just helps get the wrinkles out. Like I want the starch specifically to make my fabric crispy, uh, especially if you're teaching beginners or you're cutting and your sewing is not very accurate. Heavy starch is your friend because you're going to basically turn this fabric into cardstock. And if you've ever tried, or maybe when you learned how to sew, you started sewing on paper it's a lot easier, right? Because it doesn't move and stretch and get distorted and stuff on you. Okay, so here. That was a couple passes of starch. Look at the difference. It's still a little fluid, right, for a medium weight, but it's nowhere near as drapey as it was without the starch. Look at that. So if you're just needing a little bit of crispiness to a project to help you cut accurately and sew, I definitely would starch, okay? But if it's a project that's gonna get washed, then don't just starch. And in those instances, I would go with the cotton wo woven fusible interfacing, okay? So hopefully that helps. Let me double check the chat real quick and then we'll move on to question number three that I have on here. Uh, Gloria is asking, what is the model number of this Juki? So this is the Juki that we sell in the shop. I've been using it here for Whip Wednesday um, for a couple of years now. We've sold a ton of these. And this is the one I prefer to use on here because I can move it in and out of the way. This is a Juki LB5020. I think we still have some in stock, yeah? Yeah, so we still have some in stock. And it's the LB5020. We ship it free in the U.S. So if you're in the market for a new machine, check it out. Because uh, I can sew, I mean, I've on the episodes of Whip Wednesday here, I've sewn garments. We've sewn tissue knits, stretch knits, cotton spandex. We've made quilts, bags, wallets, sewn faux vinyl. It's a great little workhorse. I know a lot of you have bought it just to have it as your backup machine or your travel class or retreat machine. So it's great for that. But it's just, you know, a basic uh, um, computerized sewing machine with some decorative stitches. All right. So uh, number three, question number three, is there a way to tell if an interfacing will work or not for a mini project uh, like these before you actually make it? Okay. So that is a great question. How can we tell if the interfacing is going to work or not? Well, one, the easiest way to tell if it's going to work is if you use the interfacing that the designer uh, wrote in the pattern and they intended you for you to use uh, when you're making that project, right? So that's usually going to be a go-to way for you to at least get started and familiarize yourself with that project. So I always tell my students, like, if you're not that experienced, don't just take a pattern and start changing it while you're making it for the first time. You always want to make at least one so that you go from beginning to end and you familiarize yourself like, oh, maybe this is why they had us use the thinner interfacing for this spot because it's super bulky at the seam here. So there's a lot of decisions that we make as designers that are there for a purpose, you know, and you don't want to get stuck at a point that you're like, I shouldn't have done that. And it's too late to go back, really. Okay. So... Is there a way to tell if an interfacing will work or not for a mini bag project? So here is a good rule of thumb. And, and I think the bags that we're featuring for these projects is going to be great for this. On the mini bag, this is mini bag club two projects here that we'll talk about. On this bag, because the bottom is wide, in other words, if you have a pouch, a tote bag, some type of a mini project, it doesn't even have to be super mini, but it could be bigger too. If it has a boxed bottom, something that is wider here, gussets on the sides, something like that, the rule of thumb would be that you can probably go thicker or fluffier on the interfacing, okay? Because you have room built in there. When we cinch in the bottoms, you see like this, I have space from here to here. It's not a flat pouch, in other words, okay? So if it's a flat project like these guys, there is no gusset, okay? There is no boxed corner. There's no room. There's no space. That means that the inside of the entire project itself is going to be minimal, right? It's flat. And so in something like this, because I don't have boxed corners, I don't have side panels, I don't have gussets, I'm not going to have the room 
to accommodate a bulkier or thicker, fluffier, loftier, whatever you want to call it, interfacing or stabilizer. So does that make sense? If the project is flat, go thin, thin, thin. If the project is bigger, bulkier, or has large side panels, box bottoms, or gussets, then you could go up, potentially, right? It's going to depend on the design. But I think that's just a good rule of thumb. So like on the little clip-on pocketbook here, again, yes, we have two zippers. You can open this one up. You have a panel in here. There's a lot going on, and there is room to put stuff in. But again, when you look at the side, there are no side panels, there's no gussets, there's no box bottom. So I could not, especially with the number of pieces that go into making this little zippered wallet, you cannot interface them all with like a fusible fleece. No way. <laughs> no way. When you go to flip this right side out, it will be a nightmare. You wouldn't be able to get really crisp corners here because there's so much bulk that would be accumulated in the multiple seams that inter intersect or overlap on the side seams, okay? So it might not make a lot of sense, but just try and remember it. If there's no gussets or side panels or box corners, go thinner on the interfacing. And of course, this is only going to apply if you're changing it. If you grab a pattern and a designer created it for you and you're reading the instructions, they're going to have the right stuff that they want for that project, okay? So again, on the flat ones, don't do it. So on this one, this is my little mini uh, pencil pack. It's flat here, but notice then it opens up. So this does have box bottom, not in the traditional sense. It's kind of a cool technique, and I'm going to show you all how to do it. If you're in the mini bag club number two, this is uh, project number three. So we're almost there. We're getting ready to post uh, the video lessons for this one, for the puffy pouch, okay? But in this one... We use a crisper interfacing because it allows us to achieve the shape, a crisp shape, some good body to the pouch. But here's what it also does because this one has a boxed bottom is that it also can stand on its own. <laughs> Maybe. Oh, it's rounded out from the markers, but it stands on its own. It's just because of the interfacing and the way that the bottom is boxed. Okay, so the crisp non-woven interfacing in this case helps us give it that shape, all right? So yes, it's flat here at the top, which works out beautifully for this type of a design because we're not packing anything up here, right? The bulk of it where it's going to hold your pencils and markers is down here. So it's really a cute little design, but we could get away with using a crisper interfacing on this one. In other words, the same interfacing I used here, and I used the Bozal DuraFuse, which we do sell in our online shop. I use Bozal Durafuse here. Do you do y'all think that Bozal Durafuse would work on this one? And, and we're gonna do a little question here because this is kind of an interactive class. So let's see what y'all put in the in the chat box. So my question is: do you think that I could use Bozal Durafuse, which is this interfacing, even if you've never used it before, you can have a look. Crisp, non-woven interfacing. This is the one that I said turns it into a papery crisp fabric. Would you select this interfacing for this origami Patrick pouch that has a drawstring closure? All right, I'm gonna wait a second just to see if anybody is brave enough <laughs> to give me their guess. Mary's asking, do you keep a journal on your bags you design? I didn't at first, she says, I do now. Oh, absolutely do. I have an entire notebook with all my sketches my measurements and what we're doing what and as I make another prototype change the dimensions and the numbers and it's I'm one of those I need it on paper I can't do stuff like that just on electric you know like a computerized screens or on a notepad or nothing no I need it written okay great the answers are coming in no 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 all of you get a pluses thank you it would work for what part? For this part, right? Because we talked about this has a wider bottom. It can accommodate the space, similar to the bottom area here. Er, however, that drawstring will do you in. You probably could yank it, but because it's going to be so crispy, it would be like er, 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 to get it to cinch up. Okay, so good. Y'all are paying attention. Colleen says no because it has a drawstring closure. You're exactly right. Yay! You get A pluses. Good job, everybody. So C, you don't even have to have used the product to know, okay, what is the hand of this? How is it going to make my fabric act once it's stuck together to it? And what is the design of the bag 
and whether or not that will lend itself to work or not with that project. Good. So that's y'all are thinking like designers now. Love it. All right. Next question. Let me keep an eye on the time. Uh, oh, the, the next question I have is, do you use a different thread when you're making these mini projects? So I wanted to pull up here some of my threads. So that's a great question. And I think it's important to note that the, 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 whoever was asking the question asked for mini projects. Okay. Y'all have heard me. If you've taken any of my classes and stuff, I tend to be super rough with my bags because I actually use them. So I don't have all my samples like clean and pristine. Like once we make them, I like either give them as gifts, I start using them, I go through them as my daily purse and I wreck it, I'll throw it in the wash, pick another one and start using that one, whatever it may be. And so for me, personally, I always go with a good quality, 100% polyester thread. The polyester, I choose it because since it is a synthetic fiber, it's going to be stronger than a natural fiber, like 100% cotton thread. However, that's just me because I tend to yank on everything. If it's like a tote bag this big, I'm going to pack it with 15 pounds worth of stuff and it needs to hold. <laughs> so I like a thread that's not, you know, I cannot have seams just busting out after six months of use. That's not going to work for me. So I use a good quality polyester thread. And so I'll run you through some of the ones that I use because I know people always ask like what brand and all that. So these are two of the most popular ones that I use when I'm making bag projects. And this one here uh, with the little yellow, this is Guterman Mara and it's the Mara 100. I also use the Mara M-A-R-A. -A, okay, so Guterman M-A-R-A -A 100. This is a 40 weight thread. So it's a little bit thicker if you're an Aurifil fan or you use 50 weight cotton. These are um, cotton threads. This is an old spool from Craftsy. Woo, -hoo -hoo. this is years old, y'all. Uh, this is from Craftsy and it's 100% cotton. And then this is an Aurifil thread, which if you're a quilter, you probably used. Or if you're a bag maker that followed my friend Sarah Lawson from So Sweetness, she loves her Aurifil. So you've probably used it or seen it before. These two are cotton. And so some bag makers love to use 100% cotton because they're using cotton fabric or cotton interfacing and they tend to go this route. For me, again, like I said, I tend to go with the polyester. And so this one was a Guterman Mara 100. And then the other one is from Wonderfill. And this is just their all-purpose polyester. It's called Designer. And it comes in like a gajillion colors. And it's just, you know, a basic. It's not super expensive. It's actually super cheap. Run-of-the-mill polyester thread that I can use in a ton of colors. The spools are big and I've had great results with it over the years. So either the Guterman or the Wonderfill uh, designer, the all purpose, or I, I, I mean, I still have quilting cotton, not quilting cotton. I still have a uh, cotton thread because I'm a quilter and I use the quilting cotton for piecing. It's really thin, especially if you're in the 50 or 60 weight, which really I consider or feel like a 60 weight. It's, it's nice and thin. If you're using thinner fabrics, like say you're a quilter that uses a lot of art gallery fabrics. If you're familiar with their cottons, they're super light and drapey and when I work with art gallery fabrics, I, I tend to lean more towards using the Aurifil for piecing, okay? Because those stitches, they just kind of like whew, disappear into the seam allowance, and I like it, right? So for bags, because I use them, they're functional, they're practical projects, or if you're giving them as a gift, like the last thing you want is somebody who's like super rough on their stuff to be like, oh, the handle ripped off after I used it for a week, right? then you end up looking bad and might have just been there a little bit extra rough on it and maybe you use a thinner thread, right? So I like to just use 100% polyester, but you can use, and I say this in my video lessons of the bag club, you could use a cotton one too. So I always go through at the beginning of the lessons and, and kind of walk you through and say, hey, this is what I'm using. This is the needle size I'm using. This is a thread I'm going to use for this one, okay? Um, Anne is asking, how long will the thread last? Does it get too old to use? For me... If I keep it out of like get, of gathering like a lot of dust, I find that it still works fine. But I've had older spools before that I can't remember like when I got this or what, and it just happened to be the right color. If I start getting like um, skip stitch or not skip stitches, a shredded thread when I'm stitching, because I tend to stitch super fast, so <laughs> I'll know if that thread is going to work or not really fast because the the high speed and that the a thinner thread that's kind of old and already breaking down. At a high speed stitching, it just is rubbing against the inside of that needle eye and the thread will break. So once I end up with like one thread break, I'm like, mm. I double check my threading and if it happens again, I just toss the spool because that's usually what the problem is. 
But I mean, I don't know what the, the going rate is for how long you can keep thread. I know that some people try to pull out spools that are on wooden spools from the 70s or the 60s. And I'm like, no, I'm not running that through my machine. <laughs> it's going to be like powder as soon as it starts stitching. Uh, let's see what else. Oh, good. Thank you, Linda. Yeah, I think one of you all asked earlier in the chat if I got a new cutting table here. I did, and I'm still kind of on the fence about how I feel about it because <laughs> it's not a self-healing mat. So I've been using it. I have so many cut marks in here, and I'm trying to see if I'm going to run into any issues, but I got it because it was white. So I did want the stuff to kind of stand out as I'm teaching and talking to y'all on this background. So I'm glad that y'all noticed the difference. Thank you for the feedback. All right. Oh, Chris says, I use old threads for hand basting. That's a great way to use it. So hand basting is where you're hand stitching through certain layers, but it's temporary. You're just doing it to hold them in the meantime for you to go back in and do something else, you know, attach binding or whatever it may be. And so then you're getting rid of it. So it's good for that temporary use. That's a great way actually to use them up. Okay, good. Great. I'm glad y'all are enjoying the tips. If you are enjoying this video and this live, go ahead and give it a thumbs up. You can share it with your friends too. Yeah, uh, Linda, it's not self-healing. Yeah, it's not. They gave me like a little scraper thing with it where like if I guess if you get the little raised bits of the plastic, you just scrape it off like that. But I haven't had any issues just yet. This is from Big Matt. I'll tell you all right now. The site that I ordered it from is called BigMattRotaryCuttingSurface.com. <laughs> it's a long URL, but big mat rotary cutting surface.com. That's who I bought it from. And I gave them the dimensions of this big old table. So this thing is like 46 by 90 something inches and it covers the whole thing. So we'll see. I just got it like a month ago or something. And so I'm still working on, you know, working on it, putting it to use to see how I like it. Okay, great. Uh, let me see. Okay, so that was the last question. So I'm just gonna go over the the, bat, the mini bag club stuff because I think I missed a couple questions higher up there. If you've already joined, let me know in the chat box so we know who is in the house. If you have already made the first project that went up for the mini bag club too, let us know that in the chat too. Super fun. I posted a couple of y'all's pictures on my page. Some of y'all have already made three, four, five of these. Aren't they super cute? And I, again, in the video lessons, I shared my tips for how to make it with directional prints. So this would be a great one if some of you have some pretty holiday prints or anything that has like large designs and you're afraid of cutting into it because you don't want to, like I said, turn them upside down or sideways. Oh, awesome. Nelia says, I, I, I did. I joined. That's awesome. Awesome. Hi, Vani. My friend Vanessa's tuning in. Oh, Linda says she's in and she already made the first bonus bag. That is awesome. So there are three bonus projects and five of these minis that I'm going through and on the schedule date and time. Remember that you can go in there, y'all, and print your calendar. We have uh, the printed or excuse me, a PDF calendar that you can print for both November and December. And everything is on here. The live question and answer sessions, the live Zoom chat social hours that we'll do so we can chit chat and share projects, share our hacks and show the fabrics that we chose. Those are a lot of fun. Live question and answer sessions are so that once you watch the video lessons and give the project a try, you can enter. There's a form on each one of the live Q&A uh, pages or lessons in the course, uh, and you can click the link, submit your question, and then I prep with the questions that are submitted so that I answer those questions, and then I usually take some other ones live in the chat for specific things, right? Like we're, and that way you can ask me specific questions about a project that we're working on, okay? So it just gives a kind of like another level of, of question and answer, and those have turned out to be really, really fun and great questions always being asked, all right? And then, of course, here I also include the dates on when the main five bag projects are going to get listed and posted to the course or to the club platform. So this Friday, so Monday here at noon Eastern time, the first project went up. Those are the ones that y'all are saying that you've done. Yay. Some of you have just joined. Sheila joined. I love it. Uh, Pat says, I made the first project and it turned out great. I love to hear that. That's awesome. Kathy Ann says, I made the smaller bag today and tonight I'm going to sew up some more as gifts. Oh my gosh, I love to hear it. That little mini one goes together so quick, especially since the scrap pieces of the fabrics are smaller and you don't even need interfacing, right? Turned out super, super cute. 
All right. Nancy's asking a question. She says, can I use a broadcloth fabric, which from my local shop is cotton and polyester for the, it says for the mini bus. I'm thinking you're saying the mini pouch? Broadcloth, but the broadcloth is still a similar weight to a quilting cotton fabric. I think it's usually like 55, 45 or something like that, cotton polyester. Um, it just has kind of like that slicker polyester -y feel to it, but it's not going to be significantly thicker to cause you any issues, so you should be able to use it just fine. The only thing I would say is that because the broadcloth has such a high percentage of polyester, be super careful pressing those seams because you know what happens when you press polyester fabric with high heat, right? <laughs> you get that sheen of the creases standing out at attention, right? So be careful with that. I would use like a cotton, another piece of cotton fabric over top just to be like a buffer between the heat of the iron and the actual uh, broadcloth itself. Okay, so Teresa's is asking how long is the mini bag bundle available for? So this mini bag club is going to end on Friday. Well, the doors are, the virtual doors are closing on Friday at midnight, okay? We will reopen it again in the new year, but it will be more expensive and none of the live components will be available, if that makes sense. So um, to get in at the sale price now with the three additional bonus classes that are posted already there, uh, expires this Friday, November 18th, 2022 at midnight, okay? All right. Oh, great. Nancy says, I've printed up everything that I can print out, meaning her master supply list, the club calendar, um, the tips sheet, and the PDF that went with the project. And she says she has everything already marked on her calendar for the important dates. Awesome. Great. Catherine says, I joined today. I don't want to miss out on the savings. I'm glad to hear it. You won't, won't regret it because once you sign up for the club, even if you cannot keep up with the wild schedule, because obviously this week we're posting two entire courses, there are 10, 10, yes, separate, standalone, high-definition video lessons just on how to make this pouch. And I, of course, I show you how to make it in both of the sizes, okay? So that's 10 videos just for this one. All the classes, even on these mini projects, I tend to range between five and 20 video lessons per project. So I think that tells you a lot, because if you look at this project, and I know a lot of people do it, they're like, Tch. There's no way you couldn't, even if you wanted to, you could not make 10 video lessons from this. A lot of people think, oh, and just like a seven minute tutorial, I can teach you this. Well, I teach so in depth that I need to cover all the things because I get oftentimes a lot of new sewers, beginners that like, they don't know the stitch length to use. They don't know how to rotate their rulers to get the right measurement, how to cut with the rotary cutter. So I cover everything from beginning to end every single step. So it's 10 video lessons. <laughs> for this little pouch, okay? So who knows? On this one, I don't even want to think about how many videos it's going to take me. I've taken so many notes, and I've changed the project so many times to make sure, and that's what I do as I'm designing too, is take out things, minimize things, try to simplify things so it's easier for me to teach. And if something is a little bit too tricky, I know. You know, I know my students because I know who my demographic is and who is taking my classes. And I know that if it's tricky and hard for me, I will just change it all together because I'm like, there's no way that the majority of my students will be able to get this because it's that finicky or tricky. So I will literally change around designs just so that I make it easier for more people to get successful results from it, okay? For my teaching of whatever that technique is. All right, awesome. Thank you, Maureen. She says, your videos are the best. Thank you. Rose says she watched the videos today during work. Shh, don't tell nobody. What, what kind of beans are you spilling, B? Oh, man, I'm out of it. How am I the one live here and I'm missing out on the inside jokes and chatter that's going on? <laughs> yes, you're welcome, Lynn. She says, thank you for thinking of us beginners. No problem. All right. So anyways, Mini Bag Club 2 closes on Friday at midnight. If you sign up today, you're going to save a ton of money. You get three additional bonus courses, which those three bonuses alone, obviously the courses are already posted for you to watch. Several of you all that have signed up for the club have already made the bonus one. So those video courses are there. Um, those three courses by themselves, we sell them individually in our shop for $37 each. So that's already $111 value that you just got added on if you sign up to uh, or for the mini bag club too. Okay. So Bag number one, all of the bags, one, two, three, four, five, increase in skill and difficulty as we go through them. So if you're a beginner, if you know how to sew straight, you know what a seam allowance is. Like if I tell you, hey, the needle needs to be half of an inch over from the fabric, if you can measure and do that, if you know how to thread your sewing machine, if you can use scissors or a rotary cutter to cut your fabrics, 
you can totally do this, okay? So the first project, simplest one, has no zippers, no snaps, no nothing, was this Origami Patrick pouch in two sizes, the mini and the large. That video course is 10 videos. It's already been posted with a PDF with instructions. The second one is the little puffy pouch, and this these video lessons go live on Friday in the club. So this week already, you'll be able to start on five projects if you wanted to. The three bonus and these two, this will be up on Friday. So this one does have a little band here that we can clip to the inside of a purse or a larger tote bag. It has a zipper, so don't freak out. If you have a zipper foot for your machine, I'm gonna show you exactly how to use it. It's fully lined and there's no raw edges, okay? Really cute, great for a little bottle of hand sanitizer, some lip gloss, lip balm, a lotion bar, whatever, okay? So that's that. Then number three is this one. The little mini pencil pack, super cute. We only use one zipper and one type of interfacing with fabric, that's it, okay? Really simple, has a cool finish to the bottom here where we don't box the corners like a traditional box bottom. Uh, instead, it gives it this nice flat shape here. You can pack in a ton of pencils, colored pencils, markers, pens, whatever it is. How cute is this little mini purse? Fully lined, again, no raw edges. Okay. Then we have number four, which is my little snap travel wallet. And I don't think I showed y'all this one last week. Isn't that cute? Don't ask me where the fabrics are from because these are literally the only pieces on the entire planet Earth of these fabrics. This is fabric that I designed years ago. Are y'all familiar with my Kinfolk fabric, the black and white collection I did with, um, with Timeless Treasures? I had initially pitched it to them with colors and these were it with colors. So if you've seen these in black and white, in black and white, but this was the colors. So these are the strike offs that I got. So I just had like little random scraps of it. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to put this to use. So this print too, isn't that gorgeous? I thought it was cute. Never got printed. But anyways, we have a snap here. We have space in the front for two, the little snap travel wallet, um, space in here for cards. You can put multiple cards. So if you have an ID and another card and then debit and a credit card or whatever, you have these two slots here for cards. We have a little zippered pocket right here. So again, remember, similar to what I said earlier, there's no gussets, there's no side panels. You can't put fluffy, thick stuff in here. So flat stuff, folded up receipts, a little bit of cash, whatever in that zippered pocket. And then behind this whole front panel with the zippered pocket, you have another space here, which for me, this is what I do. Dun, dun, dun. That's why I call it my snap travel wallet. I like a little compact and I want to be able to put my passport in it. Boom, boom, I'm done. Put it in a big pocket in one of my totes. I can take it out and I have everything I need there, identification and money wise, ready to go. So I really love this one. So that's my snap travel wallet. That's bag number four. And then the last one that we are definitely building up to. <laughs> so even if you don't follow along with the full schedule, make sure that you do a few of the others first before we get to this one. Not because it's difficult, it just has a lot going on because we want more pockets. Everybody always says, we want more pockets, we want more pockets. So you gotta do more cutting and sewing to get more pockets. So this is my snap-on pocketbook. It has two zippers. So whereas the other ones had one zipper each, we're then going to uh, use actually two different zipper techniques. One here on this front panel, and then one that's inserted here. So this front one has four slots for cards. Okay, so you'll sh I'll show you how to do all that. And this is one thing I mentioned before is that on the Snap Travel Wallet, we have uh, the credit card slots here are for you to insert the cards vertically. Whereas on this one, the slots are made so that you can insert the cards horizontally. So you're gonna be learning both of those, okay? On how to do them both ways. Everything again, fully lined. And then the main uh, zippered pocket up top here has a center panel that's a partition. So you can separate cash and receipts. You can put your checkbook, some cash, receipts and cash, whatever you want to do, and separate them out with this thinner partition in the center, okay? And then I went ahead and just added a key ring to the end here, again, so you can loop in if you have a carabiner with your keys or a lobster clasp and put it inside of a bigger purse. You can attach a strap, like a wristlet strap, and turn this into like a mini purse that you can tote around as your wristlet, okay? So all these different techniques. Oh, and the main thing that I know a lot of you are actually signing up because you want to learn how to do this is this technique for giving it a slim finish here on the ends of the zipper where they kind of just taper off and disappear into the side seam. If you've made zippered pouches before, you know that this is like, the worst. People will make 12 zippered pouches and like 10 look one way, two look another. Five will look one way, five a different way, and it's like hard to figure out how can I keep them consistent. This is a super easy and cute way to finish it off so that we don't have to add 
fabric to the ends of our zippers to make them look pretty or clean them up. So we're not uh, compromising the full length of the zipper here by adding that fabric. Instead, I'm using the full zipper from end to end. I want that zipper to go all the way so I have the full eight and a quarter inches that I want this way on this pouch, okay? All right, awesome. Um, Gifts HQ is asking, are we able to use a button and strap instead of a snap? You totally could. You would just have to insert it in a different place. So you're saying a button and strap. You mean like those little stretchy elastic bits? Because you can attach the button here. And when you can, uh, when we sew this to this, like the front to the, the exterior to the front part of the credit card slots, you can insert like the little hair tie type of elastic thread here so that when you closed it, you could just whoop and loop it over the button, and that could be another quick and easy way to do a closure, okay? All right, well, that's gonna be it for tonight. If you wanna get in on the mini bag club, link is in the description box, it's in the chat. You have till Friday at midnight. After that, I'll be focusing on the club, and I'll be in there doing the live chats and answering questions and doing all of that, okay? So, um, one last question. Nancy's asking, should you use a walking foot to make these? You don't really need it because we're not working with any thick interfacings here. Remember, this entire club, all five of these mini projects that we're making, the only interfacings we're using are these two. Cotton woven fusible, bell, uh, pa, uh, I'm saying bellon, like bozel and pellon. Oh my goodness, I, I need to get off. Um, uh, this is bozel fashion fuse or the pellon uh, shape flex. And then the durafuse, which is the crisp non-woven fusible interfacing, pellon, Craft Fuse 808, and that's it. Those are the only two. So you don't really need a walking foot because we're not using fusible fleece or batting or anything like that. But where you do want to maybe use your, your walking foot is if your machine does not really like a lot of layers. Because this won't be puffy, but we have a lot of layers on the side. So if you have it handy, just have it by. You know, you can kind of start. And if you see the machine is getting hung up a little bit, just swap it out and put on the walking foot. But yeah, in terms of like fluffiness bulk, I don't, I didn't need it at least on this machine. All right. Thank you, Mary Gracie. She says, anybody who's on the fence, jump into the club. It's a lot of fun. I am looking forward to seeing all the makes and the fabric choices that you all decide to use as you make the little mini bags um, with the rest of us, right? So again, you have until Friday at midnight and that's going to be it for me. Enjoy the rest of your week, everybody. Have a good night. I hope you find some time to make something that you like and I hope you sign up for my club. I'll see y'all next time. Have a good night. Everybody have a good night. I hope you find some time to make something that you like. And I hope you sign up for my club. I'll see y'all next time. Have a good night. Everybody have a good night. I hope you find some time to make something that you like. And I hope you sign up for my club. I'll see y'all next time. Have a good night.